At that very moment, I realized, oh, I'm dead, but this is quite fine. I don't care. I knew I was dead. And I also was sorry that I was uh, leaving all the people that uh, I loved and that loved me. My immediate reaction from the separation from my body was that I was really confused. I didn't know what, what, what was going on. It was just like I was, and I think because it was just so traumatic. I was just there in the presence of God and I was surrounded by light and there was just brilliant light. And in some way, I felt the existence of God. And I was saying, isn't this wonderful? What wonderful feelings I had here. I felt such tremendous love coming towards me that I, I can't even put into words what that kind of love felt like. The media loves a sensational story, and there can't be anything more sensational than hearing the personal stories of people who died and lived to tell about their experience. These stories aren't just media events, but the personal lives of ordinary people, lives filled with ordinary things except for the brief time they felt they were on the other side of death. Laurel Glass an error during a routine laparoscopic procedure threatened her life and sent her on a voyage to the light. Gloria Woodward, after having her thyroid removed, had a relapse and an encounter with a godlike presence. Al Sullivan left his body during open heart surgery and met his deceased mother. Paul Hoffman fell down a cliff. Only recently has he started to recall his near-death experience. Maureen Clinton. For her, the near-death experience was a gift she doesn't want to forget. What happens when we die has intrigued mankind from the beginning. Different cultures have different beliefs of the afterlife, and many believe in the migration of the soul. Because of modern resuscitation techniques, more people are surviving close brushes with death and are reporting an experience of light, love, and harmony. Is the near-death experience a spiritual evolution or a reaction to the trauma of the inevitable, death? We spoke with Professor Hewitt Cousins from the Theology Department at Fordham University and director of the Center for Contemporary Spirituality. When I first learned about the near-death experiences from hearsay and a little reading, I had already uh, been studying the writings of the mystics uh, of Augustine and Bonaventure, the Hesychast, and so forth. And so uh, I thought they're very similar. It's remarkable. And then also I thought, well, that's to be expected. Author of Frontiers of the Soul, Professor Michael Grosso of Jersey City State College concurred. The profound similarity to religious or mystical experience uh, mystics throughout the ages have reported similar encounters with beings of light, a sense of magnificent, unconditional love. How would other cultures feel about someone who has had a near-death experience? Well, I think at other periods of history and in other cultures that there would be uh, a context for those people who have these near-death experiences uh, to be considered as very special people and people who are uh, holy and have encountered the holy realm. Uh, I think that our uh, modern Western culture is, or has been, I should say has been, uh, not very inclined to recognize this kind of experience in that way. Popular culture started to change when Raymond Moody published Life After Life in 1974. There had been other work on this previous to Moody's, but Moody's, uh, Moody's work caught the imagination of the public. 
And so now we, we seem to be, have a changing, we're in the midst of a changing mythology of death right now. Dr. Bruce Grayson was introduced to the near-death experience as a faculty member at the University of Virginia Medical School, where Raymond Moody was serving his residency. Dr. Grayson has been interested in the near-death experience ever since. Currently, he is the director of research at the International Association of Near-Death Studies and is part of the faculty at the University of Connecticut Medical School. The near-death experience occurs to roughly 5% of, of uh, Americans, which is about one-third of people who come close to death in a near-death event. Um, it happens to people who are actually pronounced dead and then recover, as well as to people who just think they're going to die. For example, people who are in a car accident aren't physiologically impaired, but are afraid they're going to die momentarily. And these people have the same types of NDEs as people who actually are pronounced dead whose hearts actually stop. Well, the most common elements in a near-death experience are first an overwhelming sense of, of peace and pleasantness and well-being, um, and followed then by um, a sense of leaving the physical body, uh, sometimes going through a tunnel to another realm beyond the tunnel where one may encounter a warm, loving being of light, sometimes deceased relative or religious figures uh, being guided through a life review, um, eventually uh, coming to some decision about whether to come back or not, or being told, in some cases, to come back. Among the theories that have been proposed to explain the near-death experience are that this is um, a malfunction of the temporal lobe, which is the area of the brain where uh, memories, for example, are stored, which might explain the life review part of the near-death experience. Um, there are a number of uh, biochemical theories about what causes the NDE. There are neuroanatomical theories about it. Um, but these, these are all pretty much untestable and as yet untested theories about the experience. I was walking up the median when a car came down. I remember it was a 67 Mustang, came flying down the road, saw the accidents and slammed on his brakes and he went into a spin. And when he did, the car turned towards me, and the car was swerving as it came towards me. So I jumped to the right, and the car went to the right. And I jumped to the left, the car went to the left. And each time I jumped, I backed up. And the last time I jumped and backed up, the guardrail was at the back of my legs. And that's when I thought, this is, this is it. It's all over. As I went over the edge of the rocks, um, time did seem to freeze for a while, or it slowed down quite a bit, because quite a bit flashed through my mind. And I had the chance to look up into the, 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 the trees above me and the rocks that were uh, where the trees were growing out of, and I saw the, 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 them getting brighter and brighter. My body was down on the table, and there were seven people, I remember three on each side and one at the head, and then there was a lot of commotion, people coming in and out, and I was up, and I don't know how I know direction, but I was up and off to the right, which was my right, but, and I was seeing the physical body, which, and I had no physical body. I just had the essence of me, who I am. And I was in this warm, peaceful, dark place. Uh, I never saw anything, heard anything, felt anything. I didn't use any of my senses but I was more acutely there than I've ever been anywhere. The first movement I saw in this darkness was what I refer to as an exact picture of the Grim Reaper. Uh, what with his brown cloak, his skeletal bony face and hands, and they were kind of yellowish, and they kind of beckoned to me to come towards it. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I had uh, remembered that uh, my, uh, I, I sensed that someone was there, and I sensed that it was my grandfather who had died about eight or nine years ago. We were pretty close, and um, what he was telling me was that everything's going to be all right. My brother-in-law came, and again it was from my right upper side and came and, and I just knew it was him just from his, just from his presence, just from his laughter and smile and just um, his energetic being. It was like coming home. Uh, 
at some point I realized there was a being on my right. And when I kind of tuned into that, and that's the only way I can say that is telepathically, when I tuned into it, I realized it was my grandfather who had died the year before. Then I noticed in the center of this light is a very energetic movement, the movement being brown and is shifting and you know increasing in speed and size as it came tor towards me. And lo and behold, it developed into a perfect image of my deceased mother. I sensed another greater being coming from a distance, and I could feel it getting closer and closer. And the other greater being came into our space. I don't know who it was. I don't think it was God. It might have been a spiritual guide of some sort. But that being brought with it even more love and acceptance. And just when you think you've got it all, here's more of it. I was just there in the presence of God, and I was surrounded by light, and there was just brilliant light. And in some way, I felt the existence of God, which is not easy to describe, because it wasn't as though I was seeing a being, but I was, it was a knowing and an experiencing of the presence of God, almost to where it was tangible. I could then hear love. I could hear energy. Uh, I could see love. Uh, and then I could, um, I, I felt as though I could probably touch the energy or touch the love. It just, everything was so enhanced. And it was just up there. I mean, it was no judgment, no preconceived ideas of who I was or where my spirit was or what my essence was. And it was just like enveloped in all this love. I felt a vacuuming of my, my head. It felt actually like my head was being vacuumed of all earth thoughts. Anything, any negativism that I ever had in my life, it was gone. There I am with an expanded brain, uh, totally void of any earth thoughts. I knew that there were no accidents, that I was very well watched over that everything was planned, even my being there at that time in my life was planned, that it was a special gift that I needed, um, that in the whole history of time there hasn't been an accident. Uh, everything is happening the way it's meant to. This presence of God communicated to me and called me by name, said, Gloria, I can allow you to return to earth now, or I can allow you to give up your life. And which do you choose? And I remember thinking, why is God asking me? <laughs> My mother then said, it's probably time that I go back. My brother-in-law was there too, telling me, it is time you go back. I said, I don't really want to go back. Do I have to? I'm somewhat frightened because there was an ent entity down there that frightened me and I don't want to go back that way. So I was with my grandfather, then the other being came, and we had some kind of telepathy thoughts going on very quickly. And I was into that and I was into the peacefulness and oh, this is wonderful. And then I realized that the conversation, so to speak, had come around to my coming back here. And it's like I startled, and I said, wait a minute, stop everything. I, you're not talking about me going back there. I don't want to go back. When I returned back to my body, my first reaction was, wow, there's so much pain. I just, it was just so much of a difference from being in a place where there's absolutely no pain and to, to be returned. And, and really, I slammed into my body and, and just felt an incredible amount of pain. And that was probably the, the biggest part. And I was really angry about being back. I mean, here I was like rejected from heaven. I woke up sprawled on the rocks below. I was prone and, uh, on my face. And I had, uh, it took about maybe 20 seconds for me to realize that, that uh, I, was, I, was, I was alive. I was back in the air again in this dimension. And I only spun again maybe half a turn, and boom, I landed on my back on the road. And <coughs> uh, I was laying there on the road, and I remember feeling, I had a dress on, and I remember feeling 
something was very tight in my upper leg groin area and I put my hand up under my dress to loosen whatever it was and instead of encountering my thigh my hand kept going in 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 I said this there's no leg here it's supposed to be a leg here and it was very warm and soft and when I took it out my hand was bloody and I said oh god I got some kind of a cut of some sort but again the peacefulness was still with me and then I tried to tell some nurses and it just wasn't an accepted thing and you know it was just like you know you're highly medicated and you're drugged out and you're having delusions. The nurse, however, that I first explained it to did think it's, it, it is as a result of the drugs they gave me. Uh, my doctor just kind of smiled and says, well, you're here, aren't you? Uh, you know, that was my cardiologist. Immediately after the accident, I just started going along with my life as it was. Um, I didn't really sense that anything that extraordinary had happened because I didn't remember much. Um, I guess I was I was annoying a lot of the a lot of what I recalled later on. Um, maybe it was out of fear. Maybe it was out of uh, just not remembering. I don't know, but I felt it was a lot easier not to talk about it. Uh, I spoke with many persons trying to identify this thing that some people kind of frown, some people laugh, others look on with a great deal of interest. So as many persons as would listen, I would tell them the story or, you know, just a thumbnail sketch of what happened to me waiting for their reactions or their their verification, I was hoping they'd all say, oh yeah, that, oh yeah, you died and you went to heaven and you came back. Uh, at one point, a Monsignor came to visit me. Uh, I was raised Catholic. My aunt was a rather important nun at the time, so I rated a visit from the Monsignor. And I was so pleased when he came in and all his outfits and he looked very learned and I said, he's going to know what I'm talking about. And I started telling him that um, I died and I went someplace. And he said, you almost died. Yep, you almost died, but an inch is as good as a mile. You didn't. And I said, no, but I did. I did die, and I went someplace. And you could really see almost fear in, in his eyes that, uh, gee, she must have had some brain damage or something must have happened. That He was very uncomfortable, backed away, uh, and then went to visit my roommate and wound up giving us his blessing and left. It's important for healthcare professionals to know about NDEs because they do dramatically change people. And if your patient is having a near-death experience and is changing their attitudes, their beliefs, their sense of values, it's going to change how you need to treat them. I mean, they really were kind to me in the hospital. But when I tried to tell them what had happened, how I had left my body and went beyond, and it was with this bright, brilliant light, and it was like, you know, you're getting, um, you're getting shots of morphine every two to three hours, and you've been through a huge trauma right now. So what we need you to do is just save your energy and your breath and focus on getting better. And so I don't think it was that they didn't, well, I don't know. I mean, I never pursued it anymore. At that time, I just felt really rejected, so I didn't pursue it any further. I felt it quite important that I share this with my wife. Uh, and my wife, being a very well-read person, has read many, many things about this. It's been happening since time. It's been mentioned in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It's in the Bible. It's, it's all over. Uh, people have described this same particular action. However, her point to me was that that's a beautiful thing to have happened to you. However, you're, you're here and you must get on with life. You know, the society you're in, you must go on doing the things that are necessary in life. You can't dwell on it. Most of the people who wrote in were very eager to talk with us about their experiences. Uh, they had sometimes sat on these experiences for decades, um, wanting some answers to what is this all about? Am I crazy? Was it a dream? You know, was it, what is it all about? And just knowing that other people had had this experience as well made them feel much more uh, comfortable with it. And we were able to tell them um, some very validating things that, you know, you're not the only one. Other people have this. People who aren't crazy have this. Um, and that was quite helpful to them, I think. I was wandering around kind of... Um telling my story, my near-death experience, to just about anyone that would listen. And an aunt 
mentioned to me that she heard about a support group that studies this phenomena and they're trying to find out what causes it, what, what's it all about. Well, up to that point, I never even heard of a near-death experience. I, I didn't have a label for what happened to me. It was just a beautiful experience. I was left with the idea that I was the only one who had had this experience. I didn't know what it was, and whenever I would try to even talk myself out of it and say, oh, that was just a hallucination or a dream, I knew that wasn't true. So I just kind of put it in a, it didn't fit into any pigeonhole in my mind, so I just put it, left it there somewhere floating around, not attached to anything. And about four or five years later, I remember I was in the dentist's office and I was uh, reading a magazine and it mentioned Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and people who should have died but didn't and what happened to them. And I remember being so startled that, my God, they're talking about the same thing that I went through. Well, very often people, once they have had a near-death experience, had a hard time readjusting to a, quote, normal life after that. Um, the NDE taught them a lot of things that they didn't know about themselves uh, and sometimes made uh, great changes in their attitudes about themselves, about life, in their belief systems, in their sense of values, in the sense of what's important in their life, what's important to spend your time on. And as a result of this, sometimes people couldn't go back to the lifestyles they had before. One son was somewhat skeptical and probably fell into the negative side. Uh, yeah, I heard about this, but it's always in the journal inquirer or some other. Yellow journalism covers it all the time. And it, it has been, you know, expounded upon in newspapers such as that and, geez, don't tell anyone you know me type thing. Not immediately, but I would say within a month or two uh, after the near death, I became increasingly aware that um, things were different with me. Yeah, well, eight years I didn't talk about it, and I, I was going through an awful lot of rehab. Um, I've had, I had quite a bit of back physical therapy and, and all kinds of the reparative surgery, so I didn't talk about it much. Um, and I was starting to express it to a few friends, and then when I got into graduate school, into physical therapy, actually, to study what I was given so much of through my rehab, uh, you know, I ran into some people there, and I was becoming more open to what I had been through, trying to understand the human body, and actually, when I was dissecting cadavers, to really see where I was injured, which it was really pretty significant to be able to actually go into a, a human body and see where all the injuries were. So uh, it was time to really deal with it and talk about it. My wife, whom I've been married to for 34 years, I love her very dearly, and she just doesn't want this to be part of her life. I'm sorry that she doesn't. I feel very, very bad that she can't feel some of the good that I feel. And I just don't force it on her. You know, if she doesn't want me to talk to people about it in our home, I don't. I mean, I still, I'm still here on Earth to do Earth things. Uh, and one of them is to maintain a happiness with my wife. And one of the ways to do that is to kind of steer her clear of uh, my near-death experience and the goings-on with it. Every second Monday of the month, hidden away in the University of Connecticut Medical Center in Storrs, Connecticut, people gather, some to sort out the past, others to discover a future, and all for the comfort. The meeting is the International Association of Near-Death Studies Support Group. Many have had a near-death experience. All are interested in the topic. When I, when I got to the hospital, um, originally I, I walked by the room and I, and I heard someone saying, well, my name is so-and-so and I haven't had one and so I thought it was an AA meeting. <laughs> Um, and I just kept on walking, and I couldn't find I couldn't find the room. So I, I eventually made it back there, and that what they were talking about was that well, I haven't had a near death experience. Since my near death experience, there were just so many unanswered things, and uh, sometimes um, feeling uncomfortable because there was no one else to, to talk about this with. So when um, I, as I say at this first meeting and meeting people that. They were talking about my experience. They felt the same thing. I sought out the group and I found it. And oh, it was so beautiful having people accept your story as, oh yes, 
Oh, yes, it does happen. It did happen. Everyone in the support group that's um, had a near-death experience, or even people who've been going to the support group and haven't had this near-death experience but are really open to it, the similarity is there's just so much love in that room. But not all people who have had a near-death experience are so willing to talk. A few people report terrifying confrontations with death. There seem to be three different types of terrifying or frightening near-death experiences. One type is virtually the same as the prototypical pleasant, beautiful, heavenly experience, but the people experience it as, as frightening. They may talk about leaving their bodies, going through the tunnel, confronting the light, but that's a frightening experience for them. And that at some point in the experience, they realize they can't fight anymore and they give up. And as soon as they give up, it becomes a beautiful experience for them. It's pleasant, it's peaceful, uh, it's calm. A second type of, of unpleasant experience is a sense of endless void, of nothingness, of eternal nothingness, where there's no sight, no sound, nothing just the individual, whatever that is, at that, that point without any body, and eternal nothingness. And that can be a very terrifying experience. People who have this often tell us that not only did it seem there was nothing then, but they felt like their whole life had been a fantasy and never existed, that nothing ever existed. And that's the type of experience that you can't imagine just sitting here talking about it now. It's, it's utterly terrifying. A third type of unpleasant experience is the one that has frank hellish imagery. People talk about demons, about pits, about uh, fire and brimstone. And while these seem to be less common than the other types, they do occur to people. What happens when we die? Only the dead can say. The five subjects interviewed here have had brushes with death which have all changed their lives. I felt within myself that um, I would accept whatever it was that God wanted of me. And the next thing I know, I was back on earth and, you know, back in my circumstances. And um, just totally amazed. I don't fear death. In fact, I, I don't believe that I even feared death before my fall. But uh, now I, I have even a, a more profound sense of peace about it. I, I would like not uh, at my death to have any mourners. It should be I that would do the grieving that I had to leave them and reside at a far better place. This experience was a wonderful, wonderful gift that was given to me. I wound up being able to look at myself totally different. Um, whenever I kind of get lost, I pull back to seeing me through the eyes of this other being, and it's wonderful. But there's such a wonderful world on the other side, and it's nothing to fear, and it's actually really, I can't wait, but, <laughs> you know, it's not my time yet either. I've got more work to do here.